The Heli Cancer Chain Show airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. The podcast always available online at HeliCancerChain.com. Over-evaluating. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of people who are extremely measured about everything that they do. I'm not one of those people, but then I maybe I am because in personally, and I'm going to personalize this, I think very, very quickly. But over-evaluating said by the queen of risk takers. Is is that not putting that with risk taking kind of an oxymoron? I mean, those two to me in the same sentence, they jar me. Well, I think a lot of times, you know, again, going back to the whole idea of the human brain is rational. When we start to over-evaluate and under-evaluate it tends to be when we're stressed out, when we're highly emotional about a topic. <laughs> Are you an over-evaluator? Have you stopped taking risks in your life? Do you worry about every little thing you say and do? More worried about what other people think than the way you feel? Well, you've come to the right place. Today on the Haley Caster Jane Show, joining me at my table are two women who are shaking things up for themselves and hopefully for you. Up first, Kate Zuckel, author of The Art of Risk, and in our second half hour, Beth Thomas Cohn, author of Drop the Act, It's Exhausting. We'll be back with my guests in a minute. But first, welcome. I am your host, Hallie Caster Jane. The Hallie Caster Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by visiting my website, at HallieCasterChain.com and clicking on the Audible.com icon for your free book. Hey, what's more fun than a free book? And while you're there, explore our ads and support the show with a click on the links. We want to welcome our new partner, our favorite store, the finest in offering gourmet foods, Dean and DeLuca. And remember, the Hallie Caster Chain Show is always available online at HallieCasterJane.com and a host of venues including Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, SoundCloud, the iHeartRadio Network, and at our newest home on Google Play Music. What is risk? Are risk takers born or made? Are men more likely to be risk takers than women? These are just a few of the questions author Kate Zuckel explores in her new book, The Art of Risk, The New Science of Courage, Caution, and Change. Zuckel, who earned a B.S. in cognitive psychology from Carnegie Mellon University and an M.S. in engineering psychology from the Georgia Institute of Technology, is also the author of This Is Your Brain on Sex, The Science Behind the Search for Love. Her work has appeared in Atlantic Monthly, New Scientist, USA Today, and The Washington Post. She is a mom, a passionate traveler, her voice to be reckoned with. So why take on the subject of risk? Let's talk. Okay, Kate, it doesn't sound like you're a risk adverse, but I learned in reading your book, The Art of Risk, that you were feeling a sort of midlife lull, that the great risk taker you were in your youth, you were no longer, which is what compelled you to write the book? Yeah, I I was calling it my midlife crisis in reverse, because instead of getting myself, you know, a sports car and a boy toy, I found myself buying a very reliable station wagon and uh, joining the PTO. And it it really made me wonder, you know, what was risk exactly? And why was I so afraid of it all of a sudden? Enough to compel you to do some really extraordinary research that took you into all sorts of crazy places uh, uh, getting the background for this book. Let's start with the definition of risk. What What is risk? We think we know, maybe we don't. Well, I think, you know, in popular culture, we are so accustomed to talking about risk and extremes. It's either this wonderful, magical thing that's going to bring you glory, happiness, everything that you've ever desired, or it's this terrible, very, very bad thing that is going to bankrupt you. It's going to give you some kind of injury or disease or might even kill you. And so, you know, we talk about it either it's very good, you know, the stuff of our superheroes and our 
uh, are the people we admire the most or very bad, the stuff that is going to kill us and ruin us forever. And the truth of the matter is what risk is, is it's a decision making process and it is necessary for learning. And when you really distill it down, what it is, is any decision or behavior that has the possibility of a negative out, immediate outcome, which also means that, of course, that there's the possibility of a, of a positive outcome most of the time as well. The title of your book is The Art of Risk. Is there an art to risk taking? Well, you know, it's funny for anyone who's ever read uh, Daniel Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, you know, we love to think of ourselves as rational human beings. And unfortunately, the truth is we're not. And I think if you were to talk about what the brain's job is, if you were trying to make it the simplest thing you could do, what the brain does, it's in the prediction business. It is trying to figure out what the environment is going to throw at you next so you can not only survive, but hopefully thrive through it. So when you are dealing with uncertainty, you know, you, uh, gosh, your brain wants to take a whole lot of shortcuts. It doesn't want to deal with the unknowns. It wants to try to fill in as many of the blanks as possible. And that's where the art comes in, because even though there's certainly a science to us understanding now that the brain takes all of these shortcuts, how, where, and why, you know, you, your personal brain fills in those blanks really is kind of an art, because it's going to be based on your background, your experience, who you are, your genetic makeup. Uh, how stressed out you are, how emotional you are, and and therefore may take you in the direction away from from a more logical and a, a more informed decision. Okay, so who are risk takers? Who are the risk takers of the world? Are they smart people, dumb people, crazy folks like me? Because I am a risk taker, always have been. Who becomes a risk taker? What becomes a risk taker? Talk to me. Well, we often talk about risk taking as if it's a personality trait, right? He's a risk taker. She's a risk taker. I'm a risk taker. But the truth is, is that because risk taking really is just that simple decision making process, we're all risk takers. It just means that some of us happen to, you know, utilize that decision-making process when we're dealing with, you know, gunfire or million-dollar business deals. And some of us just handle it when we're trying to decide whether or not to have that third cup of coffee in the morning. But ultimately, it is most basic. All of us are risk takers. Now, some of us, though, we like more sensation in our lives. We maybe have a higher level of sensation seeking. We like more stimulation. We can't get out of bed unless we have a certain amount of stress in our lives. Some people thrive in different kind of domains and environments. So I think what we, we stereotypically think of as a risk taker is someone who probably is a greater sensation seeker. They just need a little bit more going on in their life to get motivated to get going. And do we bring in the gene pool? Do we bring in uh, how we were raised? Do we bring in what, what what is the difference between those of us who go for it and those of us who contemplate it before mm -hmm. and if we go for it? It's actually a combination of our genes and our environment. Certainly scientists have now identified several genes of interest when it comes to risk-taking behavior. But a lot of those genes have to do with what I would consider negative risk-taking. So uh, future incarceration, which I think most of us can agree we're, we're not that interested in, drug addiction, and impulsive behavior, things that, that really kind of get you in trouble a lot. But there has also been a look at people who are more successful risk-takers, and it seems that they have a certain genetic profile and brain setup that allows them to sort of think things through and think several steps ahead had of any decision. And so while some of us, you know, will have that genetic background where we do need more stimulation, we may be more out there on the edge. For the most part, you know, the people who are really successful risk takers, they're the thoughtful, prepared people. They do their homework. They know their domain inside and out. And therefore, they really can sort of minimize the uncertainty and help themselves make smarter, more optimal decisions. You, you talked about a couple of reasons why people might take risk, risks, but let, let's go into that a little bit deeper, if you will. For fun, for danger, breaking rules, boredom, some are good, some are bad. Can we, can we explore that a little bit more? Sure. You know, if we're talking about sensation, you know, uh, some of it's going to come down to familiarity, right? And the example I always give for this is the New York subway system. So I grew up in the Northeast. I went into New York City all the time. Even when I was 10, 11 years old, I was taking the subway by myself, never thought a thing about it. You know, obviously, I knew not to talk to strangers and to not make eye contact, that kind of thing. But, you know, there was nothing about me taking the subway. Now that I live in Texas, 
I talk to people and I tell them that I used to take the subway like that and talk about my kids perhaps taking the subway, they are just appalled. They think that that's a matter of, you know, that would be bad parenting. Basically, your Metro card is just an invitation to be mugged or raped. <laughs> but then you turn it around, right? You take that same you know, Manhattanite, hardbred city person and put them in a rental car in the middle of Minnesota and they freak out. They don't know what to do. They think that's so dangerous and scary. Um, so to start some of it, what, what we'll do, what we won't do has to do with familiarity. And a lot of times when we talk to soldiers, firefighters, extreme sports folks, you know, they come from a background where either people in their families, maybe their parents or friends were doing these things and kind of introduced them to these things. So they're a lot less scary and they're a lot more familiar. I think the second part of that is, you know, it comes down to how much sensation you need in life. And we all have our passions, the things that move us. And, you know, some people it's going to be, you know, baking or uh, knitting. Some people it's going to be extreme sports, base jumping or drag racing. But it's funny, even within any of those domains, you can still take risks. You know, you, you look at a hardcore knitter and you see that the kind of patterns they try to do, they really push themselves and try to work at the edge and they fail a lot. You may not think that that's all that exciting, but to them it is. They're really pushing their brain. They're really, you know, getting a lot out of the experience and they're really improving their skill set for doing so. A lot of people, there's a great line from, from a Broadway, sh- an off-Broadway show that ran for years, The Fantastics. I'll never forget. I love this. This I, Have you ever seen it? I have not. Oh, no. Well, if you can find it, it's probably one of the great musicals ever, ever. It's, it's, it's based on the Capulets and the Montagues, and it's just beautiful. But there's a great line in one of the songs there. Please, God, don't let me be normal. <laughs> 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 I heard that when I was a kid, and that just made such an impression upon me. You know, I don't want to be normal. You know, oh. as you can tell, I haven't led exactly a normal life. But that's not always good, and that's not always bad. Here's the thing about about it. First of all, you brought up the point of decision making. I think you said the good risk takers are ones who who make very conscious and, and thoughtful decisions about the risk right. that they take. But I don't know that the, I I don't know if that's always true. Maybe. Well, well, go ahead. You want to jump in? Go ahead. The thing is, when you have that background, they don't necessarily realize that they're thinking it through. They have the experience to know what variables to focus on, which ones not to. And so it may not always seem like a big conscious decision to them because they already know a lot of the knowns. They know a lot of the unknowns and they can really sort of distill down what they need to be focused on. Those of us who aren't as familiar, we don't. We're, we're distracted. We're all over the place. We get really dragged down by variables that probably may not actually mean that much. So for a lot of people, it may not seem like they are being that conscious. But that that's the gift that experience gives you. I guess, and so it's intuitive. The process can be almost intuitive. Yeah, and, I, you know, a lot of times we talk about intuition like it's this mystical, magical thing. But really, you know, from the brain perspective, intuition is just a pattern matching process. It is thinking up the world around you with your past experience and trying to take, you know, the best practices from your past experience and apply them to this new situation. And if you have good experience, chances are that intuition is going to take you to great places. If you don't have good experience in that particular arena, it can sink you. I also think that intuition is kind of an interesting process because some of us are certainly far more intuitive than other people are. And I always think that that has something to do with how quickly our brains process versus somebody who doesn't process quite as quickly. Uh, That's entirely possible. And, yeah, I don't know that anybody's looked at that though, yeah. because people have intuition about a lot of different domains. So, right. you know, I, I think it might depend on, on what life situation you're in. And, and when you intuit, you can you intuit, you can intuit on an intellectual level as well as an emotional level uh, together. Certainly. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know that everybody does. I've had people on the show who say to me, I could never take a risk. I just, I've let, you know, I, I'm just, that's just not who I am. I'm so admiring of people who can. What do you say to those people? You know, I think that everybody really is a risk taker. And the thing is, when we've sort of talked about it in these extremes, when we really inflate it into something it's not, we don't realize some of the biggest risks in life pretty much everybody undertakes. Child rearing. I mean, having a baby, they give you this infant after you give birth and you take it home and you're somehow expected to help it grow into a, you know, reasonable, capable adult. That's a huge risk because, you know, no matter how great of a parent you are, you know, you still feel like you're, you're not doing it right. That's a huge risk. You know, things about in terms of, you know, even staying home can be a risk. There's a risk to and risk from because think of all the things that you might miss out on, whether it's a great partner, whether it's a new job, whether it's, 
you know, a new hobby that's going to, you know, really, really fulfill you or just new friends. Every time we say no to something, we're also taking a risk. And I think that's the part that people don't understand. We may have to push ourselves sometimes out of our comfort zone, but that's really the way the brain is set up to learn and to grow. If you always do the easy thing over and over again, the brain just gets into a rut. You're not going to get anywhere. Um, But when you kind of push yourself and work at the edge and you do take risks, whether it's trying, you know, your book club, trying a more complicated nonfiction book or experimental novel, or whether it's taking up rock climbing or tango lessons, your brain loves that kind of novelty, really soaks it up. And and it's something that that can make you sharper and better in other areas of your life as well. So those who are risk takers, thrill seekers, often are heroes and heroines, right? Maybe they're just a bit crazier than the rest of us. Maybe, Maybe we shouldn't celebrate them because they're simply wired to do what they do. And I guess I want to take it to judging those who do take risks or those who don't. Because there is something weird about risk taking or that I think we celebrate and applaud our risk takers, but at the same time, we caution. It's a weird message. So at best, we're often told to think twice, take control. Well, you know the drill kiddo. Talk to me about that. Well, I think what's really fascinating to me, because I brought that up. I spoke with Steph Davis, and she is a world-renowned free solo climber and base jumper. So she climbs up these amazing peaks with no ropes whatsoever. And then she jumps off of them with nothing but a squirrel suit and a parachute. (laughs) But when I was talking to her and I said, look at these crazy things you do, or, you know, she made this comment, people only ever see the outcome. They don't see the hard work that it went into something. And really, this is actually something that all the risk takers I talked to spoke about because people see these outcomes and they don't realize how hard people work. So we see the firefighter rushing into the burning building. We don't think about the hours upon hours of training they've had in fire safety, in, you know, fire science to really understand when it's okay to go and when it's not. You know, we talk about people who who are artists and we don't look at how much time and passion they really put into their craft. So I I think it's important to realize that the outcome isn't isn't the entirety of the story. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And certainly the successful risk takers, they're just not fly by the seat of their pants kind of people. But the other point that I raised was that we sometimes encourage people, take the risk and Mm -hmm. and send the second message, which is, well, don't don't. Well, you know, J.K. Rowling, uh, who's the author of Harry Potter, you know, she has this great story about risk, right? Because she was a single mom. She was barely getting by. And then she went to these coffee shops during the day and wrote Harry Potter. And, of course, it's a wonderful story, and she's made billions of dollars now. But how would we talk about her if she hadn't sold Harry Potter, right? It would be that, oh, that mom who didn't get a job, who was working on a book about boy wizards. What was wrong with her? <laughs> you know, so we definitely have these mixed messages. And I think what that is is we, we understand that the risk has the positive and the negative side because – a lot of times, especially when we, we risk big, when we put our all into something, you know, the potential outcome, negative outcome really can be too much to bear. And certainly if you look at different disciplines, whether it's business, epidemiology, we talk about risk in a very, very negative way. It's the thing that's going to kill you. It's going to give you a terrible disfiguring disease. It's going to bankrupt you. It's going to have you lose your family, your everything, your all. And yet it seems like we're also saying you need to take that kind of jump in order to succeed. I guess the trick is knowing which jumps to take. And I think, you know, that goes back to having having that that background and that experience. And, and you know, that, that brings you to the point, which is so you fail. But yeah. at least you did it because, you know, I always, I always say, you know, at the end of life, I don't want to look back and go, I don't want to look at what I didn't do. <laughs> I want to look at everything I did. And I tell my kid that, you know, go for the gusto, kiddo, live it. What do you say to that? I think that was the other thing that a lot of these risk takers, the successful ones talked about, you know, they don't see their mistakes as failure. And in fact, to to quote Steph Davis again, she told me, I haven't failed. I just haven't finished yet. And I think about that, actually, you talk about stitching something on a throw pillow in terms of, you know, please don't let me be normal. I put this one on the couch as well. I just think about all the things that we could accomplish if we didn't take our failures so personally, if we didn't take them so much to heart or as a sign that we should stop what we're doing. What if we said, okay, this this is just a sign that I'm approaching this in in, in a not optimal way. Let me go back. 
let me take what I've learned and let me try again in a different way and see where I get then. And that's what so many of these successful risk takers do. They really take their failures in stride and they fail and they fail quite a bit, but they just find a way to learn from those mistakes and really apply them in their future endeavors so that they don't fail the same way twice, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. You want to take, let's take it to the present. Let's take it to Mr. Donald Trump. I know you like to talk about him. I love to talk about him, but you know, he gets nailed a lot for the fact that, you know, he, he went bankrupt or he bought companies. He did this, he did that, he did the other thing. In the meantime, at the end of the day, he has to be laughing because guess what? You know, here he is. He took a huge risk. He put his own money up on the on the whatever. Whether you like his politics or you don't, I think he's the consummate risk taker who turned his failures into into positive things. Well, I, and I will say this for him. You know, we say that he put his mo- own money up on the line. He took out a loan against that. Well, so you can he put say his money that up on the line and he's going to get that paid back. So think about how smart that was in terms of doing your homework and setting up a contingency plan. He'd get that money back or at least get some of it secured back. That was kind of a smart risk. Now, where I think he, he's failing in terms of the risk department is he won't pick a particular platform or issue. He keeps waffling on the different issues and policies. And I, that's going to lead him astray, ultimately, because we don't know, you know, he likes to say, well, I don't want to have to box myself, in a, box myself into a corner. I won't know what I'll do as president until I'm in that situation. But he's not giving the voters a lot of, you know, data on what his values are and what he'll do in a pinch and, me, and how he'll represent the American people. And so I think he's going to fail there once it goes into the general election. Well, I don't know but, what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. But let me, as right. far as risk taking is, is, is you're talking, that could be the risk that he is consciously taking, however. Don't give an answer. Everybody wants to give an answer. I'm not going to give an answer. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to play it this way. I'm going to, this is my game. It's a new game and nobody's ever played it. There, there is that possibility too. I don't want to there go into the pot. I see it more as a gamble in that case. And what okay. I would see the That's difference between the risk and the gamble being is, you know, thinking about immediate versus long term outcomes. With the gamble, you're flying by the seat of your pants. And I feel like he's doing that with a lot of foreign policy and a lot of other questions right now and not giving the answer. He wants to give a, a very, you know, um, cute response about why he's doing so. But I think he's really doing it. And in this way, I think you're right. It is a conscious decision to cover up what he can't explain or what he, he doesn't know very well in terms of foreign policy. He's, he understands business very well, which is why, you know, last week he was talking about giving haircuts on uh, bonds and stuff. And then, you know, people were like, whoa, 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 you can't do that with the economy. You know, this, that would ruin the global economy. And then he backtracked from it. But I think he learned that when he does state a position, you know, he, he kind of gets nailed for it. So taking this sort of dodge and weave approach, you know, that probably is a conscious decision. I just think ultimately it's more of a gamble than a risk. Okay, that's fair. And, and I think that's a good word to bring up because that helps us explain risk, good risk taking, bad risk taking, gamble versus, and there are a lot of different adjectives that one can uh, can use or verbs. Listen to me. This is interesting to me as well. Over-evaluating. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of people who are extremely measured about everything that they do. I'm not one of those people, but then I maybe I am because in personally, and I'm going to personalize this. My head just I'm, I think very 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 quickly. But but over evaluating said by the queen of risk takers is is that not putting that with risk taking kind of an oxymoron? I mean, those two to me in the same sentence they jar me. Well, I think a lot of times, you know, again, going back to the whole idea of the human brain is rational. When we start to over-evaluate and under-evaluate it tends to be when we're stressed out, when we're highly emotional about a topic. And that's something else I think that is really sort of uh, shaping this election is just how angry and how fueled by loss so many voters are at this point. They, they want anybody who's going to promise to bring their, their jobs back or better times or what have you. You know, so those things really do change the equation. And what's funny is there are actual studies that show the brain taking these shortcuts, you know, uses a lot of information from emotion. Because if you, emotions, you know, they're these, these faint glimpses of, of your past experience. They're kind of pushing you towards something or pulling you away from it. But if you think about something just as simple as the lottery, right? When the Powerball goes over, you know, $500 million, everybody's playing. And even though we know, and in fact, you can even go on the website and see that it's like a one in a hundred million chance of winning. You start thinking about, oh gosh, how awesome would it be to win? It's going to solve this financial problem for me. I'm going to buy myself a Ferrari and I'm going to drive into work on Monday and I'm going to tell my boss to take this job and shove it. 
I don't have to worry about college or this or that or the other. All those hyped up good feelings as you're talking about it, what that does is all of a sudden your brain isn't thinking in terms of one in a hundred million odds anymore. It's all of a sudden translating that into some odds, some odd of, you know, some chance of winning. And, you know, that's better than one in 100 million. And, and that's why so many of us end up playing, even though we know better, even though we're basically throwing that money away and we'd be better off solving our financial problems by taking that $20 because a lot of us won't just spend a dollar, we'll buy $20 worth of tickets and, and putting it into, uh, you know, some kind of investment account for, for either our retirement or our kids' college fund. I, I want to focus on something a little different for a second here, and that's youth. And, and risk-taking, teenagers, underdeveloped minds and peer pressure and social pressure. It, it's, it's too often a, a toxic combination. And, and all of us who have lived a certain amount of life know of some pretty horrendous things happening to kids because of bad decision-making and poor risk-taking. Talk to me about that. Well, it's funny because we often talk about the teenage brain as being underdeveloped or, you know, that they're making stupid decisions. But the thing is, is that Mother Nature actually had something in mind when she set up the teenage brain this way. And while certainly it can lead in, in to, I mean, devastating consequences, what it's doing is it really is ramping up rewards and motivation in the teenage brain. And it's kind of dampening down, you know, sort of conscious thought. They just don't have the experience. So really, you know, what scientists are learning is that teenagers, they need that kind of brain setup to set them out in the world so that they can fall down seven times, get up 826, and basically gain all the knowledge that they need to become capable adults. You, you can't do it without, you know, that whole line about omelets and breaking a few eggs. You can't become a capable adult without taking a few risks and learning, you know, the limits of, of your body and your brain, learning how the world works, learning how to emotionally regulate when you fail or even when you succeed learning how to work well with others. And that's where risk-taking is really important in those teenage years. They have to get out and really sort of push boundaries and gain some independence so they can learn the things that they need to to go on and, and you know, become the adult that won't be living in your basement forever. <laughs> and poor mothers and fathers, right? Oh, my gosh. You have some suggestions on how to become a better risk taker, if you will. And let's look at some of them. You begin with suggesting that people reset their definition of risk. Right. Well, because we, we talk about it in such extremes. And as you said, we talk out of the both sides, out of the both sides of our mouth when we talk about it. It's really good. You need to do it to succeed. But oh, my gosh, it's going to kill you and you're going to lose everything in the process. So we need to not think about risk as being good or bad per se. We need to think about it as being necessary. It really is a critical component to learning, to basically building your skill set to personal growth. And if we keep talking about in extremes, what happens is we, we make it something other. We make it something that's that's so far out of reach and best left to superheroes and, you know, substance abuse addicts. And, and, and that's not what it is. So I think once we really understand the brain and its system for shortcuts and, and why risk is such an important part to learning, it's something that we can better harness for our own personal success. Here's another, know what you can't change versus know what you can change. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about, you know, how some of us are more wired for sensation seeking, for stress. And there are some gender differences. You see some differences in age. So, you know, know yourself. Uh, are you more of an impulsive kind of person? Are you someone that is always kind of, you know, acting first, thinking later? Or are you someone who overanalyzes everything to death before you make a move, sometimes missing the opportunity because you spent so time deliberating over it? If you know what kind of decision maker you are, what kind of sort of baseline risk taker you are, that can help you because you know whether or not you need to take a step back and say, wait a minute, is this something that I should be doing? Or whether you need to take a step back and say, come on now, get over this. You need to push forward. The good stuff is over the hill as long as you keep moving. And then take the leap. Yes. And that so many of us, I think we talk ourselves out of opportunities and we think that we have very good reasons. But if we took a step back and just sort of asked ourselves, what would the potential negative outcomes be? Would they really result in a loss that is too great to bear? And most of the time, I would argue the answer is no, it wouldn't be too great of a loss to bear. And by automatically saying no, by getting stuck in our habits, we're missing out on an opportunity to learn, to grow, to bring more joy to our lives, to meet interesting people, but also to successfully age. You know, one of the things that keeps coming up in successful aging studies, the people who lead the better quality lives later on in life, 
you know, they tend to eat right. They tend to have lots of physical exercise, the two things that nobody ever wants to hear, right? <laughs> um, they tend to have more sex. They're very intellectually stimulated. They, they have lots of social connections, but they also embrace novelty. They tend to take a lot of risks. And of course, it's hard. It, these are correlational studies. So it's a chicken and egg problem. Are these people doing all these things because they feel better or doing these things making them feel better? But I would argue, what do you have to lose? If nothing else, you know, you go out, you try new things, you push your limits a little bit, even if it's little things like taking a tango class or taking a different route home from work or not always going to the same restaurant and ordering the same dish every Thursday night. Just pushing yourself in little ways can have, I think, pretty profound consequences on, you know, your your success and happiness. So, Ms. Kate Zuckel, The Art of Risk, I know how hard you worked on this book. I know how much research you did. I know some of the crazy things you got yourself into in the middle of doing all of this. How's that risk-taking thing coming for you now, lady? It's actually been great. I, I'm, I'm somebody who was getting to the point where I just kept saying no without good reason. And so taking a step back and asking myself, you know, why am I saying no? It's led to me dropping, you know, a few clients that were really dragging me down. It's opened me up for more passion projects and stuff that I'm really excited to be doing. You know, it's it's something that's, that's taking my family and I. We're traveling more. We're experiencing more. We're trying new things when we can. And it's a lot of fun. I've been speaking with Kate Zuckel, author of The Art of Risk, The New Science of Courage, Caution, and Chance, by way of the National Geographic Society. For more information about Kate and her work, visit her website at www.katezuckel.com and be sure to follow her on Twitter at Kate Zuckel. You are listening to The Helly Caster Jane Show. My guests today are Kate Zuckel, author of The Art of Risk, and Beth Thomas, author of Drop the Act, It's Exhausting. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. Hi, this is Helly Caster Jane. Are you enjoying the show? I hope so, and I hope that you'll tell your friends about it and help us grow our family. How can you help? That's easy. Share the link to the show with your friends or my show's player, and I would love it even more if you'd recommend they visit my website at HallieKesserJane.com. I look forward to seeing all of you there. Beth Thomas Cohn was in the fashion industry for 16 years. As co-founder of the public relations agency, B Squared Public Relations, Beth launched new fashion brands and breathed life into older ones. She previously worked in the fashion department at O, oh, the Oprah magazine. Her book, Drop the Act, It's Exhausting, is one woman's call to all women to embrace the imperfections in their lives and to air their improper thoughts about all aspects of their lives. She says that by not being ashamed or apologetic about how we really feel, women will become more aware of who they are and more accepting of themselves and one another. Let's talk. Let's get going. Today on the Hello Kessie Jane Show, we're talking about taking risks, changing things up, breaking out of our comfort zones, and drop the act that's exhausting fits right into the conversation Getting real, which is what really this is all about, Beth, not so easy. I mean, authenticity. What happened first before we go any place further? i got to know this. What happened that got you to write this book? Did you wake up one day and say to yourself, I am so <laughs> full of shit. I'm tired of it all. <laughs> Talk to I, me. I don't know. I'm kind of embar- I am embarrassed to say that I never, ever thought writing a book would be something that I would do. I know people dream of doing this, so I'm feeling extremely fortunate. But I think I just got so tired of trying to navigate through life politely and and figuring out the truths of the world. And I just got super frustrated. And every time I looked for a resource, whether or not it was something as complicated as marriage or having kids or a career or something really simple, just like getting up in the morning, I couldn't seem to find honest accounts about most of those things, short of like Jenny McCarthy's pregnancy book, which is like, you know, a little bit older. But she had, you know, she had something to say and it kind of resonated with me. And I just got frustrated with kind of trying to figure it all out. And I thought, if I just put it out there, do you think that people would appreciate it? (laughs) And it turns out that they do. (laughs) That's kind of how it started. I wish it was some huge, amazing story, but I just got a little annoyed with everyone's crap. (laughs) And well, no, I 
I totally get that. I totally get it. But listen to me. You have quite a personal story. You're biracial, daughter of divorced parents, money, and not and and married a Jew. I mean, I love I that. Complicated it, right? I, well, I think it's great. So, so many of us in 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 our youth culture, as youth, we suffer identity crises. How could you not? I can't imagine. There were no role models for you to, to follow. Talk to me. How did, how did the effect of all of that have a sense on who you became as an adult or your sense of self? I mean, I think I honestly didn't realize for a very long time, I'd say probably until the age of maybe about seven, seventh grade, so 13 or 12 or 13, that I was different in my home and in my with my friendships and, and my family. I was just Beth and it didn't make a difference that my mom was white and my father is black and my parents were divorced. And my father was remarried and one had money and all these kind of strange circumstances. And I realized around me, it didn't look the same, but I just, it really didn't resonate with me until people made me more aware of it. And then once they be, I became aware of it, when I became kind of like past those formative years, and then, you know, you're in the years of like, you start dating and you start managing female and male relationships and all these kinds of things. I realized that I was kind of roadblocked a lot. And, you know, certain guys were like, oh, she's hot, but I can't date her because she's half black and half white or can't date her. She's not Jewish or I can't date her because she looks Jewish. (laughs) It was just I I couldn't keep up with all the, the things that were thrown back at me. And then all of a sudden I thought to myself, you know, let me look around. And again, I went to a private institution where a lot of the differences were magnified in a positive way and cultural diversity week. And we had a diverse staff and all those kinds of things. So when I went out of the bubble, I realized even in my own town, in my own suburban town, that I was different. I didn't feel that way right off the bat. Teen years are hard anyway for anybody. Yeah, I mean, so how did that affect you? What, 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 what were you thinking to put out there? You know, how were you presenting yourself? I mean, I think what I originally did was I was being myself, which I, of course, would like everybody to be because, you know, I I feel that that was very important. But at the same time, I kind of dumbed myself down and quieted my voice down a little bit so that I would blend in with, quote, the norm. And the more I was this gregarious, funny, smart, you know, mixed race, divorced child person, (laughs) I think that it was a little obtrusive to people and slightly threatening. I didn't realize at that age that I was like that. And I think to some adults, I was a little much for them to handle. And I think I was, because I was so honest and different and all those kinds of things, it was a little unfamiliar territory and and frightening a little, a little for my friends and my friend's parents. And so, you know, in turn, I was always made to feel, and, you know, strangely enough, which I don't think I've ever said, and I've done a lot of press on this book is that the parents made me feel more ostracized in situations, I think, than the kids ever could have. Hmm, It just kind of trickled down to their children. Yeah, that's fascinating. Listen, I'm of the theory that we're all actors in our own plays and that much of what we put out there is about the image that we want to believe about ourselves first and that we want people to believe about us. You know, that has a lot to do with this, this, this whole concept that you're coming up with. Can you, can you, can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that? And I think I think for me, what that what I find what I think is so important about the book, but makes it a little bit more difficult because I'm not the Amy Schumer of the world, <laughs> is that it was really important for me to write a book as a real person and and not this you know giant celebrity. And of course, there's not, I'm, I'm thrilled that there's the Lena Dunham's and Amy Schumer's and Tina Fey's and um, Amy Poehler's out there that are just kind of like here I am woman, hear me roar, and I can be fat or thin or short or fat or whatever it is. And everybody's kind of taking to that. But it was really important for me to be a real person who lives a real life, a real normal, quote, life, to convey these messages. And I think it was important for women to read the book where I'm not given any special kind of tendencies the way a lot of other people are in that media world of celebrities writing books. Not to say that that's not important, but so when I'm conveying my message, I want everyone to realize I am just a regular person. I happen to, yes, have a wonderful career and write a book, but though that was my biggest message so that they could relate to me. I think it was hard for me because I was I couldn't find anybody relatable to me and I figure okay you know if you're white you can relate if you're black you can relate if you're Jewish you can relate you know I feel like that puts me in a very specific particular important position while I'm giving all this information out because I think it would be very difficult for somebody who was you know one denomination just a little bit more sectorial to come out with all of these 
things and opinions and well, I guess it's not really opinions, just suggestions, I should say. You know, it's interesting. I was just thinking when you were talking that, you know, we're all different. We all have our, our, our shtick. Everybody in the world has their thing that they come with, you know, the package that they come with. And, and you know, you and I might look at somebody else and say, you know, uh, they're they're different or they're all the same, you know, but I'm different. I don't know. Maybe at the end of the day, we all have our stuff and we're all we're all the same, you know. Yeah, in a, in a way, everybody. I think that I think the difference is you need to be able to own that, and so instead of hiding behind it, I think part of it I talk about it in the book about I don't even remember if I use this quote, but I I happen to use it every day. Mm-hmm. The attack of the killer clones, <laughs> um, like that's how I feel a lot of times, especially in my area. I walk into Starbucks and I'm like fully, you know, the one with the blonde hair, white child, and I look like this, and I'm the nanny, and everyone's wearing a tennis skirt, and everyone's go having coffee after they drop the kids, and then they're going to the club. Like, that kind of evolution of certain demographic areas have not changed. So as long as everybody definitely has their thing or feels their differences, I, I say issue those disclaimers, because if you don't, you know, a part of you kind of gets lost a little bit, and then you're not quite sure who you are anymore. I think that's like one of my favorite quotes that I'm a big Instagrammer. And I read a quote the other day was, be careful who you pretend to be because you might forget who you really are. I I think that's brilliant. And and I think it's brilliant on on a, a number of different levels. And the thing about it is, is that a lot of times what we put out there is because we don't want to yeah. look at who we really are. We want to make this up and so the whole world can look at us and say, aren't you wonderful? Aren't you terrific? So you get to that moment, Beth, you know, that moment when you have to go by yourself and you have to go away. And it comes to everybody's life. No matter yeah. how crazy they are running around and doing whatever it is they're doing, there's that time that hits you and it goes, uh-oh, I better sit down with me and I better take a good hard look at me, which is why this book is so great, by the way, because... It does that. It makes you have to look at yourself when you think through the things that that Beth Thomas Cohen is saying in her book. And I also think that sometimes I feel like why wait? And, you know, my mom is like a perfect. My mom is, you know, obviously older, older than you. She just turned 70. And I said to her, you know, mom, she's reading the book and she's giving it to her friends. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm talking about masturbation. And my mother's reading this. And my mom is so conservative. And she's thinking she called me one day and she's like, I love it. I think it's amazing. And and this and that. And I thought, oh, my God, by that age, I would hope everybody's act is dropped. And I think my point is I don't want everyone to feel like they have to wait to be 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 to, to, to drop the act. I want them to feel like they can, they should do that or start to do that or try to do that earlier on. You would think, right? But I will, I will tell you this being just a little bit older than you, not a whole lot, but a little bit older than you, that something happens uh, when you're hit around, <laughs> around 50. I don't know what the hell it is, but something goes on. And suddenly, and I'm sure if you speak to a lot of women, they'll tell you the same thing of, of that particular age group. You don't give a hoot. Right. They all do. It, it's the craziest thing. It's just suddenly. I, I think I just didn't care always. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of us did. I, that's the thing, though. See, one of the things that I think is good about this is it's pointing out to people who may not even realize yeah. how full of it that they really are to take a good hard look. Because guess what? You are full of it. It'll be a lot easier if you let go a lot of uh, some of yeah. this stuff. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, it's, it, it fascinates me. Listen, this is something else that I think is, is kind of strange. You know, first of all, we live in this crazy media time. Uh, well, yeah, right. You know, so you can, you can pretend to be anything you want to be in this world because who really knows you? And, and I, it's, I think my daughter, who when I say this, this is going to blow your listeners' minds, but my daughter's nine. She's in fourth grade. She'll be 10 in September. I think literally she's the last one of any of her friends in her age group that is not on social media. Good I think you. that, and, and there's no negotiation with it, so she doesn't even ask me. And if anyone ever asks her, then she goes, you know, back to the, her subconscious and gives them verbatim what I would say and sound just like me, like, this is ridiculous. There's no reason for you to be on it. But it amazes me that girls, especially who are so impressionable at that age, are now forcing themselves on this kind of platform where they're already changing who they are. It's earlier and earlier. That's crazy. It's crazy to me. I think, okay, listen, everybody goes through something. Everyone feels out of place. Everyone grows up. I mean, you know, the, the book is not supposed to take that away. I mean, that's part of getting older. But, but, in, but because of social media and because of all those pressures, especially for females, now the age, I mean, she's nine years old. 
Frightening. Frightening. I mean, frightening, frightening, frightening. And I'm so frank with her that, you know, I tell her honestly what the reasons, I give her legitimate reasons why I think it's completely inappropriate. And it's working now. She's nine. I mean, I'm sure we're going to have this argument again in, in a, another year or two. But I'm amazed and I'm amazed what goes up there. And I'm amazed that a lot of the parents just say, okay, because other kids are doing it. I don't know. It's everything against you know, what I think is, is appropriate for that age. I'm not, uh, who am I to make past judgment on everybody else? But for my child and, and being that I've worked in media for shy of 20 years, I see what goes on. And it's just, it's amazing to me that the, it's, it's just setting a precedent so young. But Here, Here's something else. Women, we are people pleasers. I don't know that men are inherently people pleasers, but I do know that women are. Talk to me about that. I mean, I definitely would like my husband to be a meal more pleasing <laughs> <laughs> in every area, but like, especially like just doing things. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I think, first of all, I do think, and again, I have no medical degree, but I feel like there's got to be, so, there is a genetic difference between the two of us, for sure, between men and women. And I think we are inherently slightly more, you know, humanistic in our nature. It's just men and women. And of course, that's a broad spectrum. And I'm, it's not a speculation. I'm just assuming that's kind of the general feeling about us. I just had this conversation with my the principal at my daughter's school. There was an, an, an incident, several incidents. And I, and I said to her, I am not going to tell my daughter to be nice to people who are not nice to her. Stop telling her to be nice to everybody. Just be nice to everybody. I'm like, no. The world doesn't work that way. I said, I don't want her to go out and ever use bad language or raise her hand. But if someone is not nice to her, I don't need her to turn around and be nice to them. That's just, I don't, it's not necessary. And I'm reading this book about a, a kind of relational aggression between girls where in, instead of being, you know, aggressive physically, they're using relationships in a way that they kind of, you know, they use the niceties. To, to kind of bully and push other girls around. And I think it's a huge, huge problem because it, it, it's, oh, it's almost worse. I'd almost rather them deck her than use this like relational aggression. And I think we were just always taught to be, quote, nice. <laughs> and it's ridiculous because it, it, it gets you nowhere. It gets you nowhere. And, and I think that's a, a good point. And particularly in this dog eat dog world that we're in right now, I, I just think that young women and young girls have to be prepared differently than they maybe yes. could have been when we were growing up. Here, here's another aspect I want to go in with you. Women strive for the perfect life. We've got it all together. You know. We dress the best. We run the perfect household. We have perfect kids, a perfect marriage. We never fight, right? We seamlessly marry work with our personal lives, and oh, we work out and take care of our aging parents, and life is wonderful, and who the hell are we kidding? I mean, the title of your book has the word exhausting. That's not even the word. Let me throw out the word that I think is germane to this conversation, perfectionism. <sighs> And I have failed miserably. Well, me too. Me too. As I sit in my house that that is a total tidal wave from the weekend of 100 people in my sweatpants, picking up my child at 4 o'clock, talking to you, having cooked dinner. I mean, no way. There's just no way. And you know what? I am so not doing it anymore. And I don't try. And I don't, you know, it's, we set ourselves up for failure. And then if we don't achieve it, we feel badly about ourselves. And it's totally ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. I, I had a conversation with someone who said to me, wow, you owned a PR company and you went back to work. She overheard me speaking when your daughter was three weeks old. Why did you do that to her? That's what she said to me. Why did I do that to her? I'm like, what? Did I, why did I do what to her? Why did you leave her when she was three weeks old? I was like, um, what? I, you know, no, something had to give. And at the moment, it was that. And I was crazy working hours, whatever it is, you just can't have it all. And you can't have it all at the same time. Such an important lesson. No question about it. Uh, here's another one. Listen to this word. Uh -huh. I don't think you can relate to this at all. Control. <laughs> <laughs> control. Uh. Uh, on the face of it, I think a lot of us think that even if subconsciously that we can control others, if we control our self-image, it, it may be the opposite of this is true. Right. Yes, I did make a note about I didn't want this to be completely about the book. I, I did make a note of it that I did go through a little bit of an, an eating disorder issue at a, at a certain point in my life between kind of the end of high school and the beginning of college. And I obviously have been therapied up from head to toe for my entire life. So I am at one with my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being is I felt so out of control with all the behavior and everything that was going around me that the only thing I could control was my food intake. And it's so ridiculous 
but it resonates so well because I just, I just felt out of control. I didn't have control. I didn't particularly want control. And I think that you have to give, you know, something's got to give. And, you know, unfortunately I was at it in it, you know, sick and, and not in the right place. But I think back to myself and think, you know, I'm almost, I'm almost the more elated person to walk into Starbucks and sit down with a coffee and oatmeal by myself next to a group of women who are sitting all together. I actually appreciate not being with them. Hmm. And I li- I feel liberated by not giving, I don't know, I can't, can I curse now? I don't know if I can curse. I won't curse. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> by not caring that I almost want to raise my hands up and be like, ha ha, see me over here by myself. <laughs> you know, but that's, it just goes to say, I just feel so comfortable not needing to meet every Time every morning at eight thirty, meet five women to go. You know, I don't know. It's just there's something to be said for letting go. Honest to God, kiddo, the word was running through my head when you were talking. Letting go. That is so hard to do. Oh my so God. And it is so liberating, but so hard to do. I, I, let, let me take this. I want to yeah, keep I'm going out on all these limbs with you, but I think it's really yeah, no, Im- important to the conversation. You, you, you mentioned you've got kids. Yeah. We all want to be the perfect mom. No, I'm horrible. <laughs> but we all want to be the perfect mom. We we strive to be the perfect mom. But, you know, here's a lesson for people that I think is really, really important. And that is be the perfect mom is a huge mistake for a number of reasons, right? One of them is if you put it out that you're perfect, then your kid thinks she has to or he has to be perfect. Yes. And then you're setting them up to fail. Like you got to show that's the, the premier lesson place. I think why your book is so relevant, because as a person in a family system, you have to let go of the crap, the bull. Yeah, and I also think it's just, I I mean, I, I, I also have two girls. So God is giving me the finger for sure. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 I'm kind of happy that I have girls in the sense that I'd rather hopefully raise them the way that I am in a way and I can help mold and shape that. But I mean, the other day, my old my older daughter suffers from anxiety for sure. And I said to her, she said, what's wrong, mommy? I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm anxious about something. And she said, you're never anxious. And I'm like, yeah, I'm anxious. <laughs> I just, you're so, you, I said, you communicate it beautifully. You sit and say, mommy, I'm feeling anxious about this and da, da, da. I said, sometimes I can't identify that I'm feeling really anxious about something, but I'm really nervous. I don't know, maybe it was an interview or something. I said, I'm really nervous about an interview. She said, but it's so easy for you. I said, yeah, but sometimes I get nervous. And it was just so interesting because she thought, you know, I, and I never put up the perfect tent ever. I mean, I'm full, you know, I am a total train wreck half the time and she knows it. And I said to her, that's so funny, honey, that you wouldn't think I'm anxious. And she said, well, you know me, daddy and I are a little more anxious than you. And I said, yeah, but everybody feels those emotions. And it was such a pivotal kind of conversation for her because I'm always like, don't worry about what you look like and wear whatever you want. And it, you know, it's just a, a shift of focus. Yeah. Um, and it was really, really important for me to kind of remind myself that I have to, you know, sometimes if I'm internally, emotionally challenged at a moment that I can, you know, relay that to the girls in some way that they can understand at their age. So here's another one I want to go with you. You worked in the fashion industry for a long time. Women, body image. Ugh. I imagine you have a couple of thoughts on this. And let's keep this one quick because I got about five more questions and we're running out of time. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I worked in fashion. I, you know, like just to put it in a nutshell, I loved what I do. I love what I do in the sense that I like building, you know, entrepreneurs and I do have obviously a love for beautiful things. And, but I was, something was always missing. I definitely, it was emphasis in the wrong syllable kind of thing. And I think that I was always looking for something more because it did lack that that sense of substance that I really, really, uh, I, I crave, but it did allow me, uh, you know, a mil- I had a, a wonderful career. I worked for wonderful people at wonderful companies with wonderful colleagues and, and, and things like that. And I'm forever grateful. I am a media mongol because of them. I don't need talking points or publicists, you know, simple things like that for the book have been amazing. But I do think that there was always, you know, I think because I worked for people like Oprah or, you know, I always geared my career towards bigger picture, important, you know, titles and things. And obviously she is not focused on whether or not you're a size two or a size 16. And, and I think that 
that was important for me to work in environments like that. So I had a very pleasant experience. But yeah, everything that you think would be in fashion, all those like awful things are for sure. They're there. Yeah, 100%. I don't know who, why people don't admit that, but they're there. Uh, women in their image, self-image and their body image, that's a killer right there. So listen to me. One thing I also want to address here is the fact that we can strive to want to be honest. There are an awful lot of people who can't handle the truth. So what do you do about that? You just do it nicely. <laughs> you can say it nicely. I, I still stick by my don't not do it. I think, you know, the, the, the whole part of the book is coming from a place of yes, not a place of no. So, and I want everybody to do things with couth and, and not come from, you know, this fire breathing dragon of vomit diarrhea of everything that you think this person should know. You know, just like anything else in life, you need to be able to sit down and have an eloquent conversation with somebody about the things that you feel like you need to be honest about. Now, when I say honest, I don't mean thou shall not lie. I think that's a very important part. But I think that if you're feeling a specific way about a specific person or a thing, that it's cathartic to have the conversation and to get it out and to stop hiding behind walls and, and, and you know, trying to fit in and look like everybody else. I think that there is a way that everybody can take the truth. It's just how you present it to them. So don't worry about whether or not your kids hate you or your coworkers call you the B word or your husband wants to leave no, you. I say to my kids, the hell with it. Totally. I say to my kids all the time, do you want mean mommy or do you want mommy? <laughs> <laughs> we want mommy. We don't like me. <laughs> so, okay, well, then you need to understand that, that the truth hurts. And, and I'm sorry, but I want you to know these things because if I don't tell you, then I'm not doing your, my job as your mom. So listen to me as we leave each other. Tell me this. Is there an art to how to drop I'm, the act? Is there one step that is the first step that you can recommend somebody take that's going to get them going on their way? I guess I say test it out with friends and family who you know love you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my suggestion because I don't think you should be doing it to the woman who's picking up your kid at carpool or whatever it is. I don't know. I think that... No, I am still learning to drop my own act. I catch myself all the time having conversations with women that I'd rather punch in the face, but I can't because their kids go to school with my kid when they say really awful, demeaning, passive aggressive, make passive aggressive comments. And I catch myself because I start getting into it with them and I start kind of playing to their level. And I have to stop my and drop my own act and think, I really don't care what they think or what they're saying. So I just need to stop and say, wah, wah, wah. That's all I hear. And, you know, I, I still have to do that. I work on it every day. My suggestion is if you feel a certain way, recognize that you feel it and then try to deal with it. Because if you don't, it's that kind of thing will just eat you up. And then eventually you're kind of like dumbing down a lot of things and feelings and you're not relaying them and you aren't changing or being who you want to be. And I think that, you know, start with the people who love you so that if you test it out, they're not going to run for the hills. <laughs> I love it. And, and so Miss Beth Thomas Cohn, when you dropped the act, Right. When you became the straight talker, what was the I biggest it and then I stopped and then I dropped it again. <laughs> what was the biggest surprise that was a result of you dropping the act? That's the one I want to know. Oh, yeah. I weeded out the ones that really sucked, the friends that sucked and my relationships with my friends, family and my husband, who I've been with for 100 years, got stronger. For sure. I realized that, you know, when I became myself and those who couldn't take it, I was like, well, then I don't think that we should be friends anyway, because I shouldn't have to not be me to be your friend. So I think they didn't like me and then I didn't like them. And of course, they're not going to like me because they didn't like this version of me. And I didn't like them because I didn't want to be like them. And so, you know, that's kind of what happened. And then all of a sudden I turn around and I still have the same best friends for 30 years since nursery school, elementary school, you know, and I just realized that my relationships with my, especially I have to say with my, my female friends, but I have a lot of guy friends too, were really authentic. And that was really important to me. That was my biggest goal, to live a life of authenticity. I've been speaking with Beth Thomas Cohn, author of Drop the Act, It's Exhausting. To learn more about Beth and her book, visit her website at beththomascohn.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Hell I Catch or Jane Show, a production of Resac LLC. Associate producer, Suzanne Probst. Music by Tony Rosales Jazz. Visit Hallie Kessler Jane dot com. <laughs>